Welcome again to another episode of the Southwest Climate Outlook. I'm here uh, with Mike Crimmins. As always, I think we're approaching our 100th episode. Actually, I have no idea, but it feels like 100. This is the Southwest Climate Podcast, not Outlook. Yeah, that takes me back to when I used to do the Southwest Climate Outlook. That's right. I have a bit of a glow from the rain (laughs) that we had yesterday. I'm hydrated. Humidity is up. Um, Yeah, it was weird. There's clouds outside. didn't really know what to do with myself. That is right. We had a uh, an, an event, I, I should say, and and for Phoenix, it broke a string of 110 dry days in a row, which is uh, pretty impressive. Tucson got some rain too. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, didn't break as long of a streak, but it's been, again, it's been a, a, a pretty dry start to our winter. So uh, we'll take it, right, Mike? Oh my gosh, this it was just absolutely delightful. <laughs> and it was a little it was a little strange uh, i hope everybody else uh had a good uh good experience with it okay so we're gonna do a little bit of a holiday version here maybe we'll be abbreviated depends on how much coffee mike has had uh how much he's he's he's, he's willing to talk uh but we're coming at you in um friday december 11th but this will probably drop sometime early next week Thanks to Ben, as always. Uh, and then we're going to break for the holidays and, and, and we'll return uh, sometime in mid, mid-January. What we wanted to cover today is just a quick overview of the last 30 days. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, that epic event that we had. Uh, we want to unpack a little bit of uh, the La Nina that is borderline strong in intensity. And then, Mike, we're going to end it up with some of our 2021 climate predictions. So I'm looking forward to hearing what, uh, what you have in store for us. Such a bad idea. Such a bad idea. <laughs> I kind of want to see your, your mood. You know? your, your <laughs> this predictions, is all psychological with you, isn't it? Your predictions are, uh, are, are pinned to how variable your mood is. So I'm a very shallow person. So you can read me like a book. Yes, absolutely. Last 30 days, Mike. Really, we just have uh, yesterday and the day before to talk about. So the Wednesday and Thursday event that finally brought some relief, precipitation, rainfall relief to the Southwest. Uh, Looking at the Pima County and the Maricopa County flood control districts for totals of of that event. And, you know, Phoenix actually was the bigger winner. Yeah, Um, it was really surprising how much they really, they pulled off. Yeah, a lot of a lot of stations downtown Phoenix, actually all around the metro area, in between a, a half an inch and an inch, which is pretty pretty darn good. And then when you look at the the Pima County flood control district for us in Tucson here, uh, most of the area was somewhere between a quarter of an inch and 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 a half an inch. Out west of of the city, fared lower than uh, eastern parts of uh, of the city. So, Mike. How big was this event regionally? Uh, how regional was this event? And um, what were the, the sort of drivers of it? This was a, I was, I was telling Ben earlier too, this, this could have gone wrong in a lot of ways. And so I was watching this event. We think a lot of us were watching this event on the forecast models for well over a week. And so we've had a, a more active weather pattern, kind of typical fall across the Western U.S. with the jet stream is, is now trying to push a little bit further south as the days are getting shorter. And um, we're starting to see kind of ridges building and then having low pressure systems uh, either kind of move along the wave train of the jet stream and kind of shoving the ridges out of the way or the whole ridge sort of flattening and then getting the low pressure system kind of filling in to replace it. So if you back up the weather maps a couple of days into earlier this week, prior to this event coming through and into earlier um, last week, you see a real strong ridge of, of high pressure building across the East Pacific and across the Western US. And then <clears throat> you'll see upstream a little tiny, um, what we call a trough that's, that's moving up over this ridge. And then it comes down the front of the ridge and then starts to turn into a more substantial low pressure system 
then effectively cuts off. So it's like disconnected from the flow at that time and actually moves to the Southwest. And that was one of the keys with this particular event to have any moisture with it at all. It had to have a little bit of time and it had to be able to move far enough south to actually draw up some tropical moisture. And I think I slacked you and Ben this animation of, of the precipitable water. It, it, it had to reach pretty far deep into the subtropics to draw up the moisture into the southwest. And it drew it up and into a pretty narrow band that, man, if, this, if the low had moved a little bit quicker to the east, it could have moved the whole focus of precipitation into New Mexico or even further into Eastern New Mexico and out of Arizona completely. Or if it didn't go far enough South, it could have been just a dry cutoff low, which we've, we've already seen several of those move through where the temperatures have cooled down, but haven't produced any sort of real sensible weather. Or it could have just kind of wandered back to into the Pacific and not done anything with us. So this, this is one of those events that we got really, really lucky. And so if you look at the rainfall across the Southwest here for the, the total for the event, it really was pretty narrow. The, the focus of the precipitation was across kind of the Phoenix metro area and out west of Phoenix, and then over um, kind of Graham and Greenlee County, and then Cochise County, and then Pima County in Southern Arizona. It did reach up into Western New Mexico, but if you go to far northwest Arizona or eastern New Mexico, there was no precip with this event. So it was very, very localized and fell across the lower deserts, which is, you know, you don't often always see that with these events that are really often you get upslope flow. And so the Mogollon ends up getting a lot of the precip. So that wasn't necessarily the case with this event. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I'm looking at the the precipitation values at Tucson International Airport. And this quarter of an inch at the airport was the seventh biggest storm of the entire year. We had exactly a half inch at our house. And it, it came in basically four or five waves. And one ended up, you know, there was an overnight pulse as a, a shield of rain moved through. And then there was a subsequent one kind of later in the morning. But then it, if you looked at the radar, this is kind of across all of Arizona. There were these little isolated cells. And if you just happened to be lucky and get caught by one of those cells, you would have picked up another 10th or even a quarter an inch. And so that ends up, you get it this really kind of pockmarked, messy accumulation of precip across mainly Southern Arizona and then over um, Western New Mexico. So this was, man, it was, it was emotionally and spiritually uplifting, but it was not a drought buster. Well, you know, any it's, sense of the word. right. So we'll get to that in a minute, but I, I mean, just how you were portraying it as, as, as luck. I mean, I, I kind of feel like things turned a little bit because boy, it just seems like the, the luck hasn't been with us. So maybe we just, it's a numbers game and you know, you can only, you can only strike out so many times during the year. And, and this one, you know, we happen to, to hit a single, if you will. Weather is, it's kind of constantly churning and the odds are against us now. And the odds are against us in the short-term forecast. If you're looking and following kind of climate prediction center, six to 10 and eight to 14 day, they've never for the last several weeks put us at any, I, maybe I missed it, but there may have been a, a brief period where they had a, um, an outlook that was um, equal chances because I wasn't sure has not gone green for above average has been below. And it's really because the Madden Julian oscillation has been, it's been waning, but we've seen that pattern come even through the early part of the fall was never really favoring us in sort of the short-term weather forecasting window. And then we've got a La Nina of, of almost strong strength now, as you mentioned, that really is stacking the deck against us. Yeah, it doesn't. The outlook doesn't doesn't bode bode very well. But let me put a, just a fine finer point on uh, and a punctuation point on on this event for Phoenix at the airport. They registered 0.44 inches, and that was their fourth largest event of 2020. Phoenix for 2020 had a, uh, a higher event, uh, a more intense event than for Tucson. Uh, in, in February, they had an inch of rain and, and Tucson actually, its biggest event of the year was, was just a little bit over three quarters of an inch. And it, um, well, I don't know what the totals are, but it's not all that different between Tucson and, and, and Phoenix. So 
that's for the year right now, right? Yeah, that's for that's for the year. It's really kind of interesting since, since we typically, when we have monsoon seasons, usually outpace Phoenix by you know a couple strides. It was the equalizer this year. The monsoon was for for Tucson and Phoenix. That's right. That's what puts us close to each other, right? There's com- uh, comparison, but yeah, you sort of alluded to this, and I wanted to spend a little bit more time thinking about the drought situation uh, here in 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 Arizona and the Southwest really as, as a whole. I took a look at the U S drought monitor and it is a very bad picture that they're painting. The authors of the drought monitor are painting for the West, but in particular for Arizona. So if you look at just Arizona, the newest drought monitor map released on the 8th of December has three quarters of the state in their most extreme, actually it's called their exceptional drought category, D4. When you look at the history of the U.S. drought monitor for Arizona, this is in fact the most D4 percentage-wise since the drought monitor began in the early 2000s. Now we've had periods, Mike, longer periods of drier conditions. Granted, we have never had as dry of a monsoon, but we've certainly had, particularly in the early 2000s, uh, multiple back-to-back years, back-to-back-to-back years of dry winters and and, and, and monsoon. And yet now we have, at least according to this map, worse drought than, 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 than we've ever had. So the question I have for you, because you you know, you pay attention, you're on the drought monitor listserv, you, you know, you, 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 um, you get those emails, you chime in here and there on, on drought conditions. And I'm just curious, is it as bad as, as, as this map is, is portraying? And what's the chatter uh, on those listservs? It's kind of hard to answer because, well, I think, as you pointed out, the, the drought monitor history goes back to basically 2000. Right. And so if you look back historically for Arizona, the last time that we saw D4, which is exceptional drought conditions, and and there's kind of rough guidance around what the expectation for D4 conditions should be. They should be very rare drought conditions. You can kind of poke around in the drought monitor and, and look at some of the historical documents, but roughly saying that those are conditions that would be experienced less than 2% of the time. Right. So, you know, once every 50 years, once every 100 years, so they should be very rare conditions. So Arizona, the last time we saw any exceptional drought was in the, yeah, it was 2018. So if you remember back to 20, fall of 2017 and then the winter of 2018 was it was a La Nina event. And we ended up having at that point was the record warmest and driest fall for much of Arizona that then led to this sort of quick descent into drought conditions. And you can look at the drought monitor maps and see that from the fall into the winter, and it really peaked on the drought monitor map anyways in May, prior to the monsoon season with about 15% of the state saw D4 conditions. And so you gotta go, you gotta go back historically. The last time, you know, prior to that, there were some tiny little blips, droughts of 2013, 2011 drought, we saw a a bit of the state with this D4 conditions go back even further, 2006, which was uh, a dry winter. At that point was was a very dry winter that led to that. And then you gotta go back to the like the 2002 drought. But none of those, as you said, Zach had the extent of D4. Cause right now we're at, what are we at right now? We're at- 76% I believe D4. Yeah, yep. And so um, 76% of the state is at the worst drought category. And I think as, as you point out, in the drought monitor history, we have not seen a monsoon this dry. I think it really is about the, the timing of the event and the short duration of the monsoon season with the expectation of the precip and the amount of precip that you typically receive across Arizona is completely taken off the books. So the drought monitor, I'm sorry, the drought indices that are used by the drought monitoring community, you know, they're in that rare territory If it's, you know, in the historical record, if it's the driest, you'd be in that less than 2% occurrence. You know, if you're at the driest, it is the single driest. So it really does seem to reflect 
at least from the drought index perspective, that we are in kind of uncharted territory for this time of year. It is worth noting that, and I, I'm not sure how many people that listen to this know this, but the, the, the U.S. drought monitor maps, which are probably the most commonly used maps, like at least in popular media, like you, you oftentimes see these in like whatever, like Washington Post or, or whenever there is articles for mainstream media written about drought or climate, like and uh, they probably use these. That these, these maps themselves are done by a bunch of people and they're, 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 they're expert assessments, if you will, that vary quite considerably from state to state and from month to month, depending on who's uh, you know, able to, to pay attention, if you will. And, 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 and uh, you know, I don't know if you have anything more that you want to say about that, Mike, but, but I think it is worth mentioning that they're subjective assessments. And so that there, there may be some drift in, you know, 2002 is a long time ago and there are different people were paying attention and, and, you know, there's a different history that led up to the, to the exceptional drought that people were painting in, in 2012, you know, fast forward to, to now it's a, it's a, it's a different context. So I think that all plays, plays into it. I think it's completely fair. And so it's, you know, it's not really, you don't really have the ability to kind of drill down in the drought monitor map and, and use it as an objective assessment of trend for drought, because as you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, a subjective map made by an expert, you know, group that tries to kind of come to consensus around that. It's informed by different people using different tools. And I think over time, the technology has changed, the access and information has changed, drought indices have changed probably given us some more, I mean, there's a really interesting study here on the kind of the, the evolution of the drop monitor map over time. But I do think that, you know, like it, the running into a novel situation with the failure of the monsoon, I think it is, it is appropriate for us to really push hard on the drop monitor map to reflect these extremely rare conditions, if not, on, I mean, the historical record is a historic record it is not all of history, right? Going back. So, but it is in the instrumental record, it is unprecedented as far as the levels of precip. So the drought monitor map should reflect that. That is short-term drought conditions reflecting really right now, the monsoon season. But if you look at the drought monitor map, there are all different kinds of drought. And a lot of those past droughts were D4 they were winter droughts, you know, where the monsoon was fine. And then there was this kind of slow evolution during La Nina winters that gave way to increasing drought conditions. And then yeah. you'll see a monsoon season come up. And so then there'll be this wrestling with, well, do we improve drought conditions? Have they alleviated the winter drought? This is an interesting situation because last winter, Arizona was not in terrible drought shape. It was largely drought free, except for the Four Corners region, which has sort of struggled with some longer term drought. But the current drought conditions are already at D4. They will get worse over the next couple of months. And there's no real room for the drought monitor to reflect these new conditions on top of the, the novel conditions that we have with the, um, the summer drought. All you're going to see on the map is going from short term to long term drought. Do you think there'll be a D5? This could be the, the Sharknado D5 drought that were um, the hyper drought. Sorry, sorry to inter interject there, but I, I wanted to add to that and just say, yeah, I think it's, I think what you don't want to do is what I was doing with the drought monitor, which is try to make some comparisons now versus previous years. I don't think the drought monitor is good for that because it is a sort of an expert assessment tool and, and, it, and it would be better to use just regular atmospheric variables to make those kinds of comparisons. When you look at Arizona as a whole, average over a whole, uh, the monsoon precipitation was 20 and a half percent of average. And this is based on the Westwide Drought Tracker data. That is, uh, we've, we've talked about this before, we don't have to re, uh, relive this, um, but, but there is no other period uh, in the, since 1990, I'm looking at the data now, that even comes close to that 28%. In fact, the prior driest monsoon was 2009, averaged over Arizona at 50, close to 51%. So that can just give you an, an example of, of how uh, dry it really was. But I will say this, Mike, I was going back trying to think of 
you know, we're moving into this, this winter period where we would bet, uh, both you and I would bet that um, it's going to be drier than average. We, we're certainly behind the eight ball already for most of Arizona, if not all of Arizona. And so I was trying to see, well, how many times has this actually, how many times did we have a below average monsoon and then a below average, average winter? And it actually was more than I thought to be honest. So 2011, so the monsoon was below average and the winter was below average. Now the monsoon was 88% of average. So just barely below average. And the winter was the 2011, 2012 winter was 70% of average. So 2011 was, was the last year it, it had, but also 2010, 2005. And then what's, what's stark here is that between 2000, four straight years starting in 2000, was there a, a below average monsoon followed by a below average uh, winter? So basically eight rainfall seasons in a row, there was dry conditions. And that like that started the whole like mega drought thing here in the Southwest, if we, yeah. if we recall. As we go forward, we're in uncharted territory with, with respect to the monsoon being a prelude and, and sort of conditioning uh, the, 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 the winter. But we've had these back-to-backs before. Not quite, I think, what we're looking at right now, right? I mean, I think that that's, that, you know, we've, we've played this game before and, you know, some of those previous quote-unquote dry monsoons were a lot wetter than this Absolutely. one. You're right on that. Yeah. And, and some of those winters weren't even that dry, <laughs> you know? So that, that's, that's where I think, it's going to be interesting. And like you, to your point with the drought monitor is that we're, we've already like it's floored right now and it could get quite a bit worse. And I think that'll be something that we'll want to talk about over the podcast through the, you know, kind of January, February is what do we think is going to happen? And you've got more expertise in the stream flow, but I think that the lack of the, any summer rain, um, you know, sort of preconditioning any precip we get in the winter, maybe it doesn't matter if it's, the dry soils, if nothing falls on them, isn't going to yield any stream flow anyway. So maybe that's a problem. You know, the the wildfire season, you know, expected to return later this spring is something we're going to really have to keep an eye on. And, you know, just the whole outlook now with La Nina's strength, and there seem to be indications that we haven't even really seen the expression of La Nina in the weather pattern yet. Like it's, it's kind of weakly present, but that it's really going to ramp up over the next couple of months. So we'd expect to see that teleconnection pattern really kind of double down in January and February. So let's let's pivot now to uh, uh, La Nina, because I think that's a good transition. Because I was trying to interrogate the question of whether or not the, the dry start to our winter uh, was an expression of, uh, of La Nina, which for those that are paying attention, or even for those that, that aren't, like is a borderline strong event. The most recent sea surface temperatures in the in the area that is the the common metric was just under one and a half degrees celsius below average they they don't measure it in terms of monthly values they take it over like it's a complicated metric but it's basically seasonal values that are that uh, are overlapping so five consecutive seasonal values below a threshold is how they defined La Nina. Mike, did that make sense? Sure. <laughs> let's, let's clarify that because uh, what ends up ultimately get getting classified as a La Nina or El Nino requires a, a protracted period below for La Nina below a half a degree Celsius below average. You know, and for El Nino, it's 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 a half a degree Celsius above average, right? And so that's average in a particular area for a three month period, and then for it to retrospectively be called a La Nina or El Nino year, there has to be five overlapping seasons that meet those criteria. So all of this is to say that the most recent month, which goes into this in- indice was close to a, was was actually a strong event, but when it when it gets averaged into the the, the months preceding it, it's more of a, a moderate event. The point here is that this is not a, a piddly La Nina event. Uh, it's actually a moderate to, to borderline strong event. We were talking about this even last spring with the expectation that La Nina was going to 
come online. There was uncertainty because it was the spring of the eventual strength of the event. And it has only really kind of come to light in the last couple of months, how this event really has much greater potential to be a strong event than we thought even, you know, a couple of months ago, you know, and I was, I was poking around too, Zach, to just see what other indices have sort of picked up on this La Nina expression. And so NOAA has their multivariate ENSO index. This is Klaus uh, Walter's uh, creation from many years back. It's a whole multivariate looking at not only sea surface temperatures, but atmospheric expressions as well. So it, it picked up on um, leaning into La Nina conditions in the May-June period, and that was only at negative 0.7. Um, so I think on this index, it, it triggers into a weak La Nina, but by August, September, and September, October, it was negative 1.2. And so if you go back in sort of previous events at this time of year, in um, both 2016 and 2017, in the September, October period, kind of prior to the 2017-2018 the La Nina event, it was at 0.6. So it's already stronger La Nina wise than it was in the last La Nina event of 2017-2018. And you got to go back to 20. 11 to sort of see it at similar strength at this time of year. It seems to be picking up, it's clear, <laughs> clearly it's picking up strength. And I don't think that we've seen a real strong expression of it in the weather pattern in the November period. But I think, and again, we know this from the, the kind of the research on the teleconnections too, is that prime time for the teleconnection with the Southwest is is really later in the winter and it, it's kind of the January, February, and even reaching into March period. So with this event, if you look at the outlooks for the next couple of weeks, the week three forecast from the Climate Prediction Center is a classic canonical La Nina, dry southern third of the country, and then a wet signal across the Pacific Northwest and the upper Great Lakes. And that's that's what it looks like for the, the, the three-month forecast going out, too. So maybe we should spell out, and we've done this before, but let's do it again, spell out the sort of canonical uh, atmospheric pattern. And so what ends up happening in these La Nina events is you end up getting the jet stream. It sort of retracts west. The strength of the jacks, jet stream, subtropical jet stream, sort of retracts west, and you end up having a, an anomalously, like a ridge actually south of, of Alaska in the, in the northern Pacific. Right. Yeah, and I think, I'm sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but we're going to, our expect, our thought was is to do a deep dive on, on this as best that Zach and I can do it in the January podcast to kind of talk about what we're seeing in the, the La Nina pattern and, you know, what some of those teleconnection patterns kind of really yeah, look like. Let's right. definitely do that. I only bring that up because I was trying to look for that sort of atmospheric pattern in the weather maps for November and going back. And I didn't really see it. And so the question I was gonna ask you, which you already answered uh, was, you know, can we, can we see that La Nina yet in the sort of averaging of the, uh, of, of the weather so far? And I, I think you answered, not really. It's not, it hasn't quite showed up yet, which is a yeah. little disconcerting. Well, right. I mean, if, you know, cause it's already been dry and it's, I mean, I think it's there and it probably has been but there's, there's other higher frequency variability kind of imprinted upon it. And as we go further in the winter, you know, things like the Pacific North American pattern, which we can talk about kind of the next um, podcast and its relation to ENSO in, in La Nina events and the retraction of the subtropical jet, which is really, that's one of those, those kind of key patterns that sort of access the moisture in a Southern storm track that becomes really critical for the Southwest. You take that away, you can run into dry, um, weather in the winter really quickly. Speaking a little bit more about the strength of the uh, event, ended up stumbling upon a Climate Prediction Center forecast, an ENSO strength forecast, which I hadn't seen before, but it's based on a recent paper published, and I'm going to get her name wrong, but Le Heru, uh, 2019 paper in forecasting where they actually, I think they spell out the, they spell out the methodology for forecasting the strength of ENSO. 
you know, Michelle, Michelle has listened to the pod before, Zach. Ah, Michelle, yeah. How do I, how do you pronounce her last name? I think it's Leheru. Yeah. Leheru, yeah. And a bunch of others who are um, the titans in this, in this field. Um, as, as she is, too. She's, she's the, one of the lead forecasters and kind of one of the lead scientists on climate prediction now. According to this method, the expectation is that there's a greater than a 99% chance, or no, sorry, greater than an 80% chance that the ENSO event during the December, January, February season will be, will be a moderate event and an 18% chance that it will actually uh, surpass the, the, the strong event. You know, Zach, this is interesting because I think we are kind of kicking this around. Have those numbers gone down? Well, I don't know because I, this doesn't give a history of what these percentages were. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because I, but, I'm but, weird. go ahead. But in reading, may, maybe, maybe yes. Because in reading the the Enso blog, while there's a bunch of cold water on the surface, which will sustain this event, which is why it's it's nearly ver- uh, certain that it's going to continue into the into the spring before dissipating, the water at the the the, the temperature of the water at depth has warmed a little bit. In, in oh, interesting. Year. Okay. Yeah, which is why they think that this isn't actually going to uh, increase to a, a strong event. So, so maybe if we had data that I just presented from last month, we would have seen that the percentages of a strong event or chances of a strong event might, might've gone down a little bit, but still 20%, 18% is, is pretty high, but it's almost certain that it's gonna be a moderate event. Yeah, and I think we're locked into that. And as you say, the persistence is there. And this will be interesting because I think that when we, we take a little deeper dive on looking at how much difference in sort of precip across the Southwest occurs between a moderate and a strong. We've had plenty of really dry winters at moderate events like that. There, it doesn't necessarily, if we go strong, it, it, they become rarer. We have less of those events in the record and they are pretty reliably dry in the moderate. We've got a lot more of those events and they are pretty reliably dry with a couple of exceptions, which maybe we'll want to talk about you know, what, what do some of those surprise winters during La Nina events actually look like? Yeah, I guess we don't want to, we don't want to dig too down deep into this now. Uh, but I, I, I do have that data uh, handy. Let's, let's save it because there was a, uh, there are a few years that had a moderate event that actually had uh, wet signatures here in the, in the Southwest. Not very many. Uh, which Not we- very many. I, and I would, I'd like to actually kind of like pick those apart on the timing of the events and stuff like that with the baseball cards for next month. Yeah, let's do it. And I'll just, I'll just preempt it here. 84, 85 had a moderate event wet in Arizona, 2007, 2008, yes. a strong event wet for many parts of Arizona. And that's it for, for moderate to above events. So, and right. And so the 2008 event is something I really wanted to kind of dive into because it had numerous events like we just had yesterday occur, which was weird. Like, I don't think you could rely on that. (laughs) Let's unpack that in January. So the only other thing that I wanted to bring up, Mike, about Enso is that it's always sort of annoyed me (laughs) just when I'm, when I'm having a bad day and I'm looking at Enso and, uh, you know, you search for the sort of the, the precipitation patterns, the global patterns, right. And you always get uh, these classic images, and they're and the, they're they're based on basically a paper that was written in in, in two thousand and one by the uh, Columbia University's IRI Simon Mason and Lisa Goddard, and I'm always like, that's a long time ago. Well, they finally updated that. It goes back even further too with Ropolewski and Halpert, which was that is the canonical one you see that those previous paper those subsequent papers were based on. From night from night 1984 or something like that. Right. And I've always wondered like, well, has these so so these maps they highlight those areas around the globe that have a, a precipitation impact and a temperature impact from ENSO. So it's it's looking at the, the correlations and the statistical significance of those correlations of the impacts of, of the ENSO event. Okay. And I've always wondered. You know, if you add in 20, 20 more years of, 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 of data, if those patterns were, uh, would change. And it turns out, for the most part, they haven't. 
The, there's an updated update to these maps. It's in a new publication. I don't have the new publication handy, but if you go to uh, IRI's website, uh, I'm sure you can find it. You're really selling this, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think what's 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 good to know is that that the the change or, or the ENSO events that have happened in the last 20 years uh, basically reinforce uh, the patterns that the precipitation temperature patterns that we know. There are a few changes, uh, a few new pattern, uh, new areas blink on. Um, but for our area, you know, it's still a, a uh, an El Nino wet signal in the winter for the Southwest and a La Nina dry signal uh, in the Southwest. Interestingly, Mike, that during a La Nina event, uh, made one of the new patterns that shows up is that the summer period is in a La Nina is wet in uh, in Mexico and Central America, except for this year. Except for this year. <laughs> so uh, well, you know, I, think, I think technically Southern Mexico and Central America were wet, if I remember uh, correctly. So it's good to know that those patterns are are um, uh, still are, are persistent. Anything else you want to say about Enso? I mean, we could talk a little bit about what the models are are saying, but we kind of know just knowing that the forecast is a, a La Nina the event that it's going to be dry. And that's in fact, what the models say, uh, anything else that you want to talk about? Well, I mean, I I'll digress for the January, but I, I hate to end it like this, but I feel like the worst is yet to come with this La Nina event. It was so amazing to see, uh, see rain yesterday. And it was, you know, I, maybe I appreciate it more now, but, but um, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little concerned that that might be it for a while. All right. Well, that's a good segue, Mike. What are your, since this is a holiday edition, you know, and, 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 and we're looking forward. My hopes and dreams. What's your, tw- maybe not your hopes and dreams. Let's, let's be real here. What's your <laughs> 2021 climate predictions? Give me your, give me your climate predictions. Can you go first? I can go first. Yeah. I want, I want, I want to, I want to, um, I'm just going to, I'm going to abuse yours. I'm going to troll you. It's basically what I'm going to do. <laughs> Well, I put a little thought into this, not a lot of thought, so be, be kind. All right. <laughs> so this runs the gamut. Here are my predictions. That there is the first one, that there's going to be a slew of COVID climate relationship papers, most of which are going to be garbage. They're going to abuse statistics, but there's going to be some really interesting ones there. So I think we're going to start seeing uh, some unpacking of what the, the, the COVID the COVID uh, pandemic and climate relationship was. I completely agree. I have already tripped over several published papers on this and the, the event isn't even over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's number one. I think what we're going to start hearing a lot about is particularly in the media is the talk is going to harken back to the drought of the early 2000s. So I think we're going to start hearing more and more of those stories like this will rival the the early 2000s drought mega drought might even uh start coming into the part the common parlance more than it, it is unfortunately but don't you think that mega drought we're, don't we have to come up with a new prefix <laughs> for the current drought conditions because we already i mean i don't know i mean giga drought i think that was that was what you said <laughs> Is that my prediction? <laughs> so do you, do you got any? Do you, do you want to submit any any candidates? No, I mean, those are, that's actually really good. And, you know, what I, I think he, that, you know, we went through a lot of gyrations in trying to understand the early 2000s, like 2002, 2003 drought situation. And I think you're right. With this current La Nina event and the dry summer back to back is going to put us in really potentially bad situation. And so, um, and I mean, there's already been, there's real concern on the river now too, with the projection for shortages, which is very well founded given, you know, what we've just kind of come through in the short term and this prospects of La Nina. So I I think you're right. I think there's going to be a lot of climate reporting for the Southwest in the spring that will be pretty dire and and look pretty bad. And we're going to have to do a lot of unpacking on that. Yeah. Uh, and the end, and uh, this wasn't part of my predictions, but I'm, I'm going to make it. There's going to be a lot of linking with th- this drought with climate change. 
Yeah, I agree. And, and it'll be, it'll be challenging too, because I think that the, the summer monsoon failure, I still don't know. I mean, I really don't know. Well, that's uh, right. I mean, th- that's part, part of the narrative. I mean, it's, it's obviously it's, it, it's conditioning. You know, if we have a, a low months, uh, wintertime precipitation following the, the monsoon season, I mean, obviously the monsoon plays a role and the connection there is much more speculative. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we're going to have our work cut out for us to try to. I think we're just going to try to get some nuance in, you know, in the, in the discussion as we go forward, because I mean, the climate change thing is definitely here and it's present and it's, it's always kind of a complicated mess in the hydroclimate down here. And, you know, we'll have to continue to kind of unwind that and, and tease that out. Right. Okay. So number three, and it, this is related, but there's going to be a lot, maybe not in the, in the mainstream media, uh, but there's going to be a lot of concern about the upcoming fire season. Mm-hmm. Okay. But uh, the fire season, here's my prediction. The fire season is going to be average to below average. Wow. Yeah. And I have a reason. Okay. The monsoon's going to be good. Oh, Zach, you went there. Oh, yeah. you went there. I went there and I have a, I have a reason. Okay, so I, I, I read this paper, but it turns out that the chances for back-to-back La Ninas are much greater than back-to-back El Nino. So there's some persistence in the, in the system for La Ninas that, that end up uh, causing two, two, two La Nina winners in a row. Okay, so if that happens, and interestingly, the forecast for Enso kind of put uh, a, a double dip La Nina at less chances than just neutral conditions by statistics. If there is a La Nina event, and given what I said before, that the Northern Mexico sort of has a wet signal with La Nina, I'm, I think that it's possible that uh, the monsoon might start early in, in, um, in Mexico and create the sort of conditions that will fire up our monsoon earlier in the, in, in the summertime. And then that, you know, severs the latter part of the, the fire season. So boom, there you have it. Oh man, Zach, you're, you're not usually this kind of bubbly, crazy <laughs> optimistic like this. It worries me. You got any rebuttal to that? My prediction was that you were going to make a prediction on the monsoon and <laughs> it would go terribly wrong. So I'm afraid that my Nostradamus moment may have just come true. Um, <laughs> well, I, you got to make a monsoon prediction. Okay, so summarize: COVID climate, a whole bunch of uh, of new papers, and 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 maybe Mike, if we can if we can find the diamonds in the rough, there we'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. We we highlighted that a little bit on an earlier episode, and I think we got some good feedback. Drought is going to be the dominant story as we head into the summer, uh, and that'll be wrapped up in the fire season. But the the double dip La Nina will c- cause a monsoon. Uh, to start earlier and we're going to have a monsoon this year and it's going to be good. So there you have it. What are yours? Okay. Mine uh, are um, below average winter precipitation, climatological monsoon total precipitation for July, August, September. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not sure I, I got that. Predicting climatology for next summer. Man, that is the most, I should have predicted that that was going to be your prediction. I can't believe you didn't. I can't believe you didn't, you didn't see that coming. I saw some, you know, and this is the problem with Twitter is you see random climate tweets. And I saw some kind of really obscure random climate tweet that was a, uh, an, an outlook for next summer, like August, next summer. And it suggested an atmospheric pattern that was very similar to last summer, which really doesn't suggest anything for our monsoon, but just the idea of saying that next summer will be like last summer is, was terrible for me. <laughs> it was one of the, it's like a, um, a private forecaster who's a legitimate, you know, weather scientist. So they're, and, they're not just making it up. They, it was caveated that it had, this forecast had no skill, but still <laughs> wasn't something out there like that, you know, where you say that, you know, last, the next summer could be just like last summer is. It's like toying with, with, with the idea that science somehow is, is better than just like making things up, pulling something out of a hat. It has no legitimacy, but the fact that it was said by a scientist in scientific way 
with the caveat that it had no skill really doesn't make it legitimate, <laughs> but it was enough to just tweak me in a way that was like, not cool. So I'm just like, you know what? Climatology, central, uh, you know, central limit theorem. Let's just, let's just go with that. All right, Mike, I got, I got a question for you then. So do you think this winter will be top five driest? Yeah, I think there's, there's a good chance. Wow. That it could, so, okay. So for what, for what Arizona, month and what location? Average over Arizona, let's say. For what months? The November through March period. Well, we've had two events. We've had November and December, which might have already taken it out of that. Well, I, yeah. Which is interesting. I mean, like we've had situations where we have had very little to no precipitation in November, December that it then carried into the later months. So we're already in some locations, a little bit ahead of where we have been in the past. So maybe that's, that's well, something to kind of put that in perspective. In mind. There are parts of the state though, like this event that missed like Northwest Arizona, Northern Arizona, Northeast Arizona that um, are really bad shape now. Right. I mean, if to put that in perspective, so I'm looking at the November through March data since 1991 for the winter, the lowest winter average precipitation was 1999 at two inches, 2.2 uh, 2 inches um, averaged over the whole area. So, you know, if you, if you just, if you sort of just project what we currently had as like a quarter of an inch everywhere, I mean, you know, there's still quite a bit more rain to uh, that's needed to surpass even the lowest value since 1991. So yeah, it's still possible, Mike. Well, Right. But I mean, you could have the January, February, March period could be, that's a different kind of drought than in lumping in the fall. So I think that that's just sort of some of the things we'll have to kind of toy with. Okay. We didn't talk about this, but I did want to mention it because uh, I think it's interesting in the context of, of the La Nina event, which is we're likely going to break the, the highest global average temperature record. So previously it was 2016 and this year was sort of running neck and neck with it. And November was the hottest year on record globally. And there is a really good chance that 2020 will, will come in as the hottest year on record. Um, so my question to you is, I mean, if not, it's going to be almost like probably a statistical tie with 2016. The interesting thing is 2016, the first part of 2016 was the really strong El Nino, which tends to add heat to the atmosphere. Whereas this year has been a La Nina. Uh, that's a little disconcerting. People have gone back and looked at, uh, well, what's the, what's the bump that you get in global average temperature from a, from an El Nino uh, and what's the suppression that you get from a La Nina. And it's, it's on the order of like, I mean, it varies obviously. Uh, and I was eyeballing this, but it's like a 10th of a degree, which is massive or particularly in the context of like trying to figure out which is the uh, hottest in, 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 in the ranks of, uh, of the average temperature over the globe, because they tend to be diff They tend to differ just by a, uh, a few hundredths of a, de uh, of a degree. So uh, a bump of uh, a tenth of a degree one way is, uh, you know, in 2016, it was on the plus side in 2000. This year, it was on the negative side. So that's a two tenths of a degree uh, difference. Right. Uh, and so that's clearly the, unfortunately, that's the, the global warming sign signal manifesting itself. But my question to you, Mike, is, is 2021 the hottest year on record? Just as you pointed out, La Nina events, mature La Nina events in the early part of the year make it a little harder to achieve that. But it's so I think that, you know, we're, is that bump lessening over time as temperatures continue to increase? Does that, is that effect kind of diminishing? I was just eyeballing this. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know, but I think that, like you said, La Nina, it, it, so probably what will be at play is how quickly the La Nina event winds down and the sea surface temp anomalies go back to, right. to normal. But you're saying no. I think that's a, that's a safe bet. It's still, it's still riding the trend. I mean, it's, it's not going to be below average. It'll be 
above average, but it's about continuing to success successively beat the previous year. This takes a little bit of the pace off of it. All right, Mike, it's, uh, it's 2020 was a pleasure doing these, these podcasts with you. I look forward to another, uh, 12 episodes in, in 2021. The wet years are the funner years with the podcast, quite honestly. But we, you know, we started this whole thing with the drought of 2011, if you remember all the way back. So we, 2021, I think is 10 years. That's awesome. I can't believe it. I know. You know, we, and, and, and let's put it this way. We, every single year we've, we've talked about, uh, uh, and so at least, you know, five different episodes. I'm pretty <laughs> sure there's only five unique episodes. I bet that we've said the exact same thing in I, how many episodes we've done, which could be well over a hundred. Now we probably, there's only five and you'd have to construct them with artificial intelligence to extract the unique uh, comments out of them. <laughs> Well, I am getting these emails. I don't know who's sending them to me, <laughs> but they do seem like they're like their artificial intelligence, just summarizing the podcast and asking I, some, some question. You'll you're per- tracked by a bot. <laughs> Cause I think that people think that you and I are bots. Um, <laughs> so it could be that it's another bot reaching out to another bot just for, for friendship. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I was convinced for a while it was you and Ben playing a joke on me, but. Uh, <laughs> you still don't know. I, I mean, don't know. I don't. We're know. never going to tell you. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, uh, enjoy your your holidays, and I uh, uh, hope to see you soon. Have a great break. Uh, happy holidays to you, Zach, and to everyone else. Right. Bye bye. Okay. You got any others? Nah. No, nah, that's it, huh? I predict that 2020 will end, and we'll be greeted by 2021. I don't know where to begin. Got so much going on in my head. It'd be so much easier just to write this as a blog. That's that's exactly the opposite of how the whole podcast started. <laughs> <laughs>